One day, I was in the shop on a Thursday afternoon, and Greta was standing behind the counter, more or less as she is in the picture, and she said to me, do you see what I've got here, Vicar? All of this conversation in Welsh, of course. <laughs> it's Miss Jones's shopping list. Every Thursday morning, her next door neighbour brings her shopping basket and this list to the shop. I fill it up and on her way back from work, Miss Jones's neighbour takes the basket home. This shopping list has been exactly the same <laughs> every week since her sister died in 1978. And before that, she said it was exactly the same since they started living together in 1940-something. It's never changed. And this one said, you know, she writes it out every week on a new bit of paper. And this is a picture that was taken in the um, local pub across the road, the Pustur, as it was called, uh, of Greta Walters on her retirement. And while I'm here, partly for Shirley's benefit, I'm also going to point out this lady, Mania Francis. For those of us who were here at St. David's Day, we heard Shirley talking about um, Welsh nationalism. We heard her refer to things happening in Pencado, a rally about the old man of Pencado, and you referred, if I remember rightly, to Gwynvor Evans, the first Plaid Cymru MP. This is his daughter, Mania. Um, and very much uh, a character in the village as well. Let me just check where I am in my notes. So what do you find out when you start looking at parish registers? If you look at a modern marriage register, you'll find the names of the couple being married, you'll find whether they are bachelor, spinster, divorced, you'll find the names of their fathers, you'll find their address at the time of marriage, and you'll see their signatures. And that's it. Um, if you go back, 150 years, you'll find that the form of register changed. And what you had was the names of the two people being married. It was simply a list of people who married. So it would be John Davis and Sarah Walters. That's it. And so you can see the further back you go with the register, the harder it is to identify people. Um, because it could be any one of John Davis's. But when you've got the address, the address will tell you a lot. Because you may well find the name of the farm. And also, having people like Greta and Miss LV, you will find that they will be able to tell you something of the history. So, if the house has changed from London House to San Beder, they'll know it's the same house. We won't know just looking at the register. And so that local information is a huge source of, of help. And if I was ever contacted by somebody in advance, before they come and see me about the parish registers, I would say, well, send me an email or write me a letter and tell me everything you already know. I would take that letter round to Greta. <laughs> and Greta would ask anyone who came into the shop in the week if she knew any connection with these people. And it's amazing what you discover. And when people would call, first of all, I'd often say, OK, let's go and have a chat with Greta, then we'll look at the registers, then go off on your trip and come back in a week's time. And you might find a whole host of relatives you didn't know waiting to meet you. <laughs> uh, because that's how it works. People summon up things from their memory which aren't going to be what you've got in the register. I put in a picture of the Lich Gate of Flandre. Hang on. It was put there in 2002, if I remember rightly. And it was given by Miss Elvie Jones in her memory and in memory of her sister. 
And one of the other things that used to amaze me about Miss Elvie was her attention to her will. She was a single lady with no obvious people to leave things to. And every week she would get out her will and check that it was still applicable. <laughs> and she would leave hundreds of prizes, all very small little fiddly things to be used for the children with the best reading in the Sunday school. Aww. The children who take part in church services. <laughs> uh, pupils of the school, and all these things had to be changed whenever anything changed. Most incredible detail, and it was her lifelong hobby. And she decided she wanted to leave money in her will for a lich gate, because we never had a lich gate. And I said to her one day, well, why don't you do it now? Why wait till you die? If you do it now, you can have a say in it. <laughs> and um, you can see it. And so we commissioned an architect, we had this lich gate designed. It rather changed the look of the whole place because it's quite a dominant feature. And she used to say to me when I would visit her, do you think I'll be the first person to use it? <laughs> <laughs> By which she meant not that she comes to church, mm -hmm. she did all the time, but will her coffin be the oh, first oh, to rest oh, underneath oh, it? Oh, oh. Now, it's not important to me, and I don't think it would be important to you, but it does say something about a Welsh obsession with death and dying and burial. Let me move on. Oh yes, there's a yew tree behind um, behind the <laughs> gate. You can see it, part of it there. It's ancient. Its trunk is about the size of this table at ground level. Um, I got a tree surgeon one day to come and tell me how old it is. <coughs> And he had to make a guess because he said, well, the only way I can tell you definitely is to cut it down and count the rings. Yeah. Um, I borrowed a walking stick from somebody one day and I wanted it because I could put my arm down the hole in the tree because you trees grow up and they grow around um, things apparently. And I wanted to see how deep this hole was. Well, even with a walking stick and my arm in up to here, I couldn't find the bottom. It was below ground level. Um, the, anyone want to guess at how old do you think that tree might be? 200? A couple of thousand. Medieval bowmen used to t grow, have yew trees grown in churchyards because of the straight sacks which they made their arrows from. So go back Middle Ages, wow. and the estimate is at least 800. Wow. Wow. There's the lich gate, me looking a lot younger, and Miss Elvie Jones looking very proud of it, and the bishop and the um, village councillor, county councillor, and the architect on the occasion when we dedicated it. Another view of the churchyard, give you an idea of what it's like, and then I'll move on to this one. Within that picture, there are at least 10 gravestones <laughs> with the name David Davis on them. <laughs> I know because I've counted them. <laughs> uh, because when we had churchyard working parties, I was often cutting the grass in that particular bit. And I put that slide up because I want to tell you a story about a family who once appeared quite literally on the doorstep without any warning. They had come from Flanethley and they had in tow a number of relatives who had come from Michigan. And they were wanting to find the grave of one of their ancestors. And the lady said, I know it's here and it's near the gate. Because 10 years ago, my husband came here looking for the grave. This is not the American, this is the Welsh, <laughs> this is the Looking for the grave, and he walked into the churchyard and he found it straight away. What's the name, I said? <laughs> David Davis. <laughs> and I tried to explain to them, if all you can tell me is David Davis. <laughs> 
I can take you to at least ten gravestones immediately with that name on it. Any one of which could be yours. I mean, can you even tell me what century he lived in? No. And I left, they left me with the feeling that the, they thought I was keeping something from them. <laughs> Her husband had discovered the gravestone and it was there and it was this unreasonable vicar who wasn't prepared to go and show it to me. And they couldn't understand, so they, they left a bit disappointed, unfortunately. Uh, I'm going to draw to a close. I'm not sure how long I've been speaking, but probably long enough and there may be some questions people want to ask. But Talking about that place, I want to show you two of the oldest things from this particular church. Uh, the first is this. We call it the Ulcanus Stone. It has a 4th century Latin inscription. It's now in the church vestry, and you probably can't really read it, but it says, Here, Jacket, Ulcanus, Filius, and then there's another name that I've forgotten. Um, here lies Ulcanus the son of. It's a Christian inscription. It's not a pagan inscription, so it comes from that period um, when Latin was still being spoken towards the end of the Roman occupation of Britain. Um, evidence of the very early nature of Christian um, Christianity being in that part of Wales. Uh, because burial was a Christian custom. The Romans and the Celts before them cremated. So you would not have had an inscription which says, here lies Ulcanus, before the Christian period. So it's also amazing to think what else you might discover if you start digging around in the cemetery. And it was discovered with some church building work um, in the late 19th century. Also at the same time, is this stone. If I tell you that it's about the same height as me, a little bit taller than me, what would you think it is? Tombstone? Tombstone? No. Top of a coffin? It's a pretty good guess and it's what a lot of people think. But the thing that gives it away are these four crosses and the cross in the middle, which is what Early Christians, and actually modern Christians to a large extent, Catholics and Episcopalians, still do. When you dedicate an altar, you mark five crosses, one in the centre and one in each corner. If you go to your local Episcopal church, take all the coverings off the altar and sit, look, you'll probably find them carved in, in the wood. Um, and so it appears to have been an ancient Celtic um, altar stone we believe from the 6th century, so the 500s. So this parish church has been a place of Christian worship, not in its present building, um, for at least the 6th century, maybe longer, 1500 years or more. The present building dates from around 1300. Nobody's really sure because you can only date buildings by what's around them. And there's nothing else of that age. Of that. Um, so it's a bit of a guess. That's where I stop for the moment. Thank you. I don't have to time myself, but I didn't want to go on too long in case there were questions. And I think. Kaiser Cranter wrote two books on the Duke of Montrose. What do you think of them? Have you read them? Two books on? On the Duke of Montrose. Duke of Montrose. The Duke of Montrose. I don't know the man. Oh. Sorry, I can't help you. Oh, OK. She has a question. Sherry has a question. Sorry, Sherry. Your church from 92. I went there in 92. Went there in 92. Was Church in Wales? Church in Wales. Was it Church in Wales or Church of? Oh, church know. in Wales. Oh, I oh, was in Church in Wales. Okay, so is that Church of England the Welsh version? Yes, um, no. Uh, until 1920, the Church of England existed in England and Wales. 
and in 1920, by Act of Parliament, the church was split so that England and Wales became separate provinces. So the church in Wales, as opposed to off Wales, it's all in Wales, um, is exa in exactly the same relationship to the Church of England as the Episcopal Church in Scotland, the Episcopal Church here in America, the Church of Canada, the Church of Australia. It has its own archbishop, its own governing body, its own prayer book. And it but, it's, it, but it's also an Anglican church, so we're both members of the Anglican uh, okay. community. Okay, so the service is Anglican. Yes. And the prayer book is the same. Was substantially the same, but we've revised it in different ways. So it's very similar to the 1979 prayer book of the Episcopal Church here in America. And that's why I was asking, because I was an Episcopalian in 1979 and the book of the prayer that we used in the church, but I went yeah. to, I was wondering if it was the same. They're very similar. In 1984, a definitive rite was produced of an experimental service which is very like Rite 1 of 79 prayer book. Um, the more modern language ones have gone on a lot further in the way that they've revised them. But it's also a bilingual prayer book. So if you, if you go to a Church in Wales service from, I think it was about 1994, onwards, they made a decision not to produce English and Welsh versions, but everything would be bilingual. So that page will be in Welsh, and that page will be in English, exactly matching it. Um, in the old, some of them, they even have the same number. Um, and it meant that if I'm in a bilingual area like this, if I'm taking a service, I can say we're on page five, and even if it's Tidal and Pimp, um, you can know exactly what we're saying. And depending how bewildered the English or American visitors are looking in the congregation, I might tell you exactly where we are. <laughs> well, my grandmother's missal um, prayer book from the turn of the century, late 1800s, uh, is all Welsh, of course, in her case, she spoke Welsh, and then they, came, they became Episcopalian when they moved here in, in 1912. Mm -hmm. And that was a common transition if you were a church in England in Wales, the church in, uh, in Wales in Wales, to go to the Episcopal Church. Yes. Mm -hmm. The Episcopal Church is part of the Anglican Communion. Okay. Yeah. And the reason it's Episcopal, um, the bit of history that I haven't given you is that when the Reformation took place, the dominant church in Scotland was the Presbyterian Church. And the Anglican Church was in a minority. Scotland, Scotland did not want to call it Anglican, because to them that meant English, which is even worse than calling somebody Welsh English if you're Scottish. <laughs> <laughs> and um, they called themselves Episcopal because they had bishops, as opposed to the Presbyterians who didn't. Episcopal is just a word meaning bishop. Um, when the revolution or the war of independence, we we'll never saw which to call it, um, took place and there were no bishops in America, the Americans decided they wanted a bishop and they elected Samuel Seabury, who was vicar of St. James Church in New London in Connecticut, to be their first bishop and he went to London to be consecrated and it couldn't happen because he was American, as part of the service, he would have had to make an oath of declaration of loyalty to the monarch. And King George III, and as an American, he would not do it. So he spent some time traveling around Britain, trying to find three bishops who would ordain him bishop, because you need three to ordain a bishop. Eventually, he went to Scotland, and he was ordained in Aberdeen, because not being the established church in Scotland, there was no declaration of obedience to the king. By the time the second bishop from America was consecrated a few years later, they had worked out a way of doing it without the declaration of obedience. 
So Sam Seagree, when he came back here as bishop, had made an undertaking to use the Episcopal Prayer Book from Scotland, not the Book of Common Prayer from England. And that's why you have got the Episcopal Church here, called the Episcopal Church. And also, why there are significant differences between the prayer books of that period and those of the Church of England. They go along with the... And if you want me to talk about the particular structure of the prayer of consecration, I will, but I don't think that's the most pressing issue. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Could you uh, tell us a little bit about the Methodist Church and how uh, the Church developed and at some point, I guess, it became independent, at least here. I can't tell you a great deal about the Methodist Church in America, because I don't know a great deal. Um, I can tell you that in England, an Anglican clergyman called John Wesley had a renewal of faith and vitality in a time when the church was very low spiritually. Um, he preached widely. He had a brother called Charles, who was a great hymn writer, and they developed a great following. Um, very controversially, and he was not welcomed by many of the bishops of the Church of England, and had his meetings on Sunday afternoons, um, outside normal church times, often meeting in halls other than churches because they were not allowed to preach in the church. And John Wesley always wanted to remain part of the Church of England. His brother was a bit ambivalent about it, but the people who followed him decided they didn't want to live in those constraints. And they, they broke off and formed their own churches, which were called Methodist, because they had a method, which is where the word Methodist comes from. Uh, there's another leading English uh, Methodist, who was much more Calvinistic in his theology, believed in predestination. Uh, the people are either damned or saved from the moment before they're conceived by God's will, rather than anything they do themselves. Uh, and that's a Cal I'm being very simplistic in that, but that's a Calvinistic thing. Uh, and they formed Calvinistic Methodists, and that was George Whitfield's followers. Uh, in Wales, you have other leaders of Methodism, like Howell Harris and John Richards, um, who developed their own following. And you get different strands, because it's Welsh speaking as much as anything else. So you will get, if you're in Wales, you'll have Welsh Calvinistic Methodists, Welsh Wesleyans, English Wesleyans, and English Calvinistic Methodists. And they're all independent, and they <laughs> form together in a different kind of denomination. And John Wesley, of course, had a big influence in America and traveled here on occasions. And there was one point where he decided that they needed more clergy ordained in America. And the Bishop of London, whose job it was to ordain clergy for the colonies, all the colonies, would not do it. Uh, and John Wesley decided that he had the authority on his own to ordain and did so. And that's one of the things that caused the break with the Church of England. Wow. Sorry, a bit of a potted <laughs> history, and I don't really know the American story. <laughs> okay. I have, oh, sorry. Have you ever heard of a hymn or seen a hymn in any of your hymnals called uh, Penny Bryn? Penny Bryn? Yes. My grandfather composed that. Really? That hymn, yeah. I just looked it up composed to make sure I had it. Composed the music. Yes, it's right here. <laughs> John Lloyd Jones. Right. And him the Yeah. Many, many, many years ago. Right. That's my grandfather, yeah. So he's a composer of Chew. Yes, yeah. yes. <laughs> uh, how, how do you pronounce that? Pen, Pen uh, Bryn. Pen Bryn. Okay. Do you know what it means? No. Top of the hill. Okay. <laughs> it's quite a common house name in Wales. Okay. You know, the house on the top of the hill, Pen Bryn. Okay. Um, you'll find that used. Are you familiar with the tune? No, I mean, I have the words here. I mean, uh, if people you, in my family know. I don't you think you'll do it on hymnary where you are, but if you go to aramus.org and go to their hymnal okay. and click on it, it'll play it for you. Oh, okay. Yeah. Oh, nice. Okay. Sure. Thank you. 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 Thank you.